All right. Um, yeah, thanks for showing up. Um, my name is Anna Winniewarter and I'm a postdoc in um, the materials department here at Imperial College. And I have been working with uh, electrochemistry for, for a while and uh, in particular with uh, a coupled electrochemistry mass spectrometry. And I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about this today and kind of put it in a bit of a, of a larger context. So starting out with, I think, something that is very positive news, which is that uh, renewable energy has gotten cheaper and cheaper in the last 15 years or so. Um, so what you can see here on this graph is that basically uh, both solar and, and wind, uh, electricity from both solar and wind uh, sources are uh, significantly cheaper than uh, electricity from coal or even from natural gas these days, um, which is great because it means that we can use the renewable electricity not only for like gen what, what we use electricity for these days, but we can also think broader and think about um, reinventing the electric uh, the, the chemical industry to to use this electricity. And there are like uh, there are many different options for that. Uh, I think the the most well known is is water electrolysis uh, to make uh, hydrogen um, and and oxygen from water. But there are actually uh, a lot more options uh, there. In, in my group, people do research on CO2 reduction, on uh, nitrogen, uh, nitrogen reduction, um, hydrogen per peroxide production, and also um, partial hydrocarbon oxidation, which is something that I've been working uh, on uh, in the past. And um, all these processes have in common that uh, we can use um, electricity to make chemicals on site, on demand, rather than having a big plant that produces these chemicals at all times. And that can be a big advantage for, for some of these products. Um, in the rest of my talk, I will give you an example for uh, ammonia synthesis and, and partial hydrocarbon oxidation. Uh, but before we go in there, into that, uh, I just wanted to highlight that that electrochemistry for making chemicals is actually not a new thing at all. Uh, I think many people are not aware of this or we tend to forget about it, but actually there are several large industrial processes that are run on the megaton scale these days uh, that use electricity. And one of them is, is the uh, chloral alkali process to make uh, chlorine gas, uh, sodium and, uh, and potassium um, hydroxides. And this process has actually been around since 1890. So it's more than 100 years old. Um, and it is it is a big process, as I say. So uh, this process alone uses about 1% of the global electricity consumption. And then there is another process that people tend to forget about, but it is there. It is almost as old and it uses even more electricity, and that's the production of aluminium. Uh, so, so the way uh, aluminium is ex extracted from the aluminium ore is actually an electrochemical process, uh, and that's why there are a lot of um, aluminium plants on Iceland where the electricity is cheap. All right, um, but let's go into, into electrochemical reactions on a, on a deeper level. So um, in this talk, I want to talk about a little bit about how we study electrochemical reactions. Um, and then I want to talk about this method that, that I'm most familiar with, electrochemistry coupled mass spectrometry. And I will show you on some research examples how we how we use this tool in our research. Um, so how do we study electrochemical reactions? Like the, the, the most common way of looking at an electrochemical reaction in, in a lab uh, situation is, is having a glass cell, uh, basically having your electrolyte sticking two electrodes in or sticking three electrodes in and measuring a current or measuring the current as a function of, of, of potential. And that gives you some information, but not very much. So we like to couple this electrochemical testing with some other techniques. That can be some uh, ex situ analysis of the uh, of the catalyst surface. So this uh, this here is an XPS chamber, uh, which allows you to um, study the the very surface of your electrocatalyst. But also looking at an electrocatalyst ex situ only gives you that much information because 
yes, you can look at your sample before you uh, run uh, electrochemistry on it and after, but the surface during the reaction will always look different. And also if you look at products, whether you determine them at the end of your reaction or during the reaction, you will get different results. And that is really why we uh, like to use in situ or online analysis techniques. And uh, electrochemistry mass spectrometry is one of many techniques that I use to, to this end. Um, and I just want to, to highlight why, why this is important. So this here uh, is a, a cyclic voltammogram. So that is a, a cyclic voltammetry is a standard technique in electrochemistry where uh, you, you record the, an electrochemical current as a function of an applied potential. Um, and what we can see here is that the, the current changes as a function of potential. That's all very nice, but we don't actually know where this current goes to. And in order to understand this electrochemical process, we really want to know where the current goes to. So um, that's why we need an additional tool. And electrochemistry mass spectrometry is a tool that can help us with that. It can tell us uh, both um, what kind of uh, volatile products we are making and how much of these volatile products we are making. Um, getting there is not super straightforward. Um, that's why uh, we've done a lot of development on, and that's not only me, that's a whole research community that has done a lot of development into this technique. Um, but before we go there, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about what, what is mass spectrometry um, and what happens inside a mass spectrometer. So mass spectrometry is basically weighing molecules. Um, and the way this is done is not by putting them on scales, that is a bit difficult because they are very small, but rather um, they are accelerated in an electric field. And then depending on the mass to charge ratio, they will end uh, at, the, at the detector with um, at different points of time. Um, but in order to do that, uh, we first need to ionize them because we cannot really accelerate uh, an, um, a molecule in an electric field if, if it's not charged. Um, so, so what we do is uh, in, in the case, in like the, the most straightforward cases, we just put shoot electrons onto a bunch of molecules, then these electrons will knock out some of the electrons from the molecule and you will have a charged molecule. But you also put in some energy into the molecule, which means that some of the bonds uh, can fragment and your molecule can um, dissociate into different fragments. And these fragments are very characteristic of each molecule. So that's why you get out a spectrum. Um, and then these ions that you generate, they are um, they go through a mass analyzer. There are different types of mass analyzers. Uh, I won't go into depth with that. And then uh, depending on the mass to charge ratio, they will arrive at the detector um, at, after different amounts of time. Um, and then they will be registered by a data system. And now that this part here with the ion from, from the ion source to the detector, this um, requires a high or ultra high vacuum. Um, which makes it a bit difficult to interface with an electrochemical cell where we usually operate at one bar or even higher pressures, where we have a liquid present that is not really ultra high vacuum compatible. So uh, there are a few challenges for doing quantitative electrochemistry mass spectrometry. So the first is this uh, large pressure gap between the electrochemical cell and the mass spectrometer. Uh, this pressure gap is around nine orders of magnitude. That's a huge pressure gap. Um, and then there are some challenges related to cell design, but that is not something uh, I want to focus on. Um, and then there are also some fundamental challenges. One is that in a, a mass spectrometer, there is always some, some sort of signal drift. So the uh, what does it mean? The intensity of the signal that you get out kind of changes as a function of time. And that is just something that is uh, inherent to these instruments. There's not very much you can do about it. And then, um, as I said before, when you put in, when you shoot electrons onto a molecule and it fragments, then you will get different fragments. But depending on the molecule, it can happen that you have you can have two different molecules that show the same fragments. So 
in this example here, you can see uh, that um, this, these are the, the mass spectra of uh, carbon dioxide, uh, propene and propane shown on like right next to each other. And what you can see here, uh, so what we what we then like to do is we, we like to choose a mass uh, where we only have one of these. So this is possible for, for propane here. There is uh, at mass uh, 29, we have a high signal of this compound and that is not overlapping with any of the others. But the other two, um, at, at their uh, largest mass fragments, we actually have an overlap. And this means that if we now have both of these species in there at the same time, it would be not straightforward to tell them apart because they will give a signal at exactly the same mass. Um, all right, but how do we deal with these challenges? First of all, bridging the pressure gap. Uh, a lot of development has gone into this in, in the last more than 50 years. Uh, different techniques have been developed how to do this. Uh, there is the most straightforward uh, version of just taking the a sample of the gas above your your liquid and putting that into uh, an instrument like a gas chromatograph, which is optimized for analyzing gas samples. Uh, but you get a very poor time resolution with that. So that's not that's maybe the this most straightforward way of doing so, but it doesn't give you very good results. And then there are there are a few other options. There is the option of using a, a Teflon membrane, like basically the same type of membrane that you have in your Gore-Tex jacket. Um, that is it um, is permeable to gases, but not to liquids. Uh, and that allows you to evaporate gases into the mass spectrometer without getting the liquid out. So that is one option. Another option is to use a crimped capillary. So that's just basically a, a piece of steel that is crimped. So you have a very, very small opening. And this small opening uh, now only allows a certain amount of gas flowing into the mass spectrometer. So also in that way, you restrict the fl flux of molecules into the mass spec um, so that the mass spectrometer can actually deal with it. So you, you, you maintain this uh, ultra high vacuum there. And then the, the third way, which is the way, um, which is a, a technique that was developed by uh, at uh, at the Technical University of Denmark um, around ten years ago, and that uh, when and they spun out a, a company, and we at in in our lab we have two of their instruments. So I will be focusing on on this uh, technique, where they kind of combine the membrane and capillary parts into one thing, and they use a, a silicon microchip for that. And the silicon microchip, um, it doesn't contain any electronics, but they use, they take advantage of uh, these well-developed microfabrication techniques uh, from the semiconductor industry. And they use this to really, to etch, etch a very well-defined structure into the silicon chip. And this structure, you can see schematically here. So there is a membrane here that um, keeps the liquid out but it allows gaseous species to evaporate into a sample volume. And the sample volume is then connected to the mass spectrometer uh, through a well-defined capillary. And again, this capillary now uh, restricts the flux of molecules into the mass spectrometer. So the, the vacuum chamber of the mass spec has a turbo pump, uh, vacuum pump connected. And by designing this capillary to a size, to a certain size, uh, we can restrict the flux into the mass spec to exactly the number of molecules that can also be pumped out at any point in time uh, through the uh, turbo pump. Um, and as I said, we have two of these instrument, uh, instruments in our lab, one of which is inside uh, an, an argon glove box, uh, which makes um, practically working with it a bit tricky, but uh, it allows us to really do high quality measurements. Um, all right, and uh, I mentioned before that signal drift can be another challenge. Uh, and the way we deal with that is we do calibration. Um, and the reason why I'm I'm talking about this now uh, is because I think that it is over, often overlooked in the community that that doing accurate calibration uh, and and figuring out how well your technique works 
before you use it. Um, people don't necessarily do that uh, because, and I p perfectly understand that it's often you have a task. Uh, your task is study this reaction. Then you want to study the reaction. You don't want to spend a lot of time developing your technique, but it is actually really critical that you know how your technique works and that your technique works well. Uh, so, so what we do uh, in this calibration is basically what we want to do. We measure a signal. Uh, if we have this mass spectrometer, we measure a signal. Uh, it's measured in amps, but we don't actually know how many molecules this number of amps corresponds to. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to map the signal intensity uh, to a molecular flux. Uh, and we do that uh, by putting in known amounts of the compound of interest into the mass spectrometer. And there are different ways of doing so. One is running an electrochemical reaction that we know very well. That can be hydrogen evolution or oxygen evolution. Um, we can use standard solutions. That is kind of the most standard, would be the most standard approach, but it is actually pretty difficult to um, put known amounts of a gas into a liquid and then use this liquid and put it onto your, your inlet uh, because the, it, it's not easy to control this amount of gas. Um, so we tend to not to not do use this way, but what we what we usually do is uh, we we just use the gas flux. So we use a, a gas with a, with a known composition. And then we since we know uh, the size of this capillary into the mass spectrometer, uh, we can calculate the flux. So this is uh, a big equation. And I don't expect you to see these uh, variables here. It is um, someone else has come up with that, uh, but it's very, very useful because we can actually calculate exactly for the different gas compositions, how many molecules go into the mass spectrometer. And that is really what we use in our group to, to do calibrations. And then um, finally, we also still have to deal with this mass overlap. And uh, Soren Scott here, um, I worked with him for the last six years or something like that. Um, and, and he came up with this idea that, um, or he didn't come up with the idea. I think other people have come up with the idea before, but he implemented that for our technique to um, account for these overlaps by doing a co-calibration. So instead of what I showed here, instead of just determining one factor, uh, one sensitivity factor for, for one mass, for one compound, uh, we just get um, a sensitivity factor for each mass where we see a signal for each of the compounds. And we get uh, a large uh, matrix equation and we solve this matrix. And then we have a sensitivity factor for each of these masses. And that means that then we can, um, we know uh, if we if we make a certain amount of, of this blue gas here, then we know we have some uh, intensity from this mass. We can multiply this uh, with the factor that we have here. Uh, so, so we know that, let's see that, say that this is a third, like a third of this signal will also uh, occur at mass 44. So then we can subtract this from the overall mass 44 signal. And in that way, we know that the rest of the mass 44 signal comes from CO2. Okay, and uh, Soren has also uh, been uh, developing um, this uh, Python uh, open source Python package called Xstat, uh, where uh, all this uh, matrix equation um, and, and solving them and using them for calibration, all that is implemented there. Um, so that's been really, really useful. Um, now, I've talked a lot about very, very detailed stuff about this technique. Now I want to move on and show you some research examples and some of them uh, with some of them with this first one, especially I will go into a lot of detail. So I hope I don't really like lose your attention completely, um, but just try and embrace it. And, and you'll see um, we can also discuss this afterwards if you have any questions. So the first example I want to talk about is the electrochemical oxidation of propene. Propene is this uh, small carbon molecules, three carbons, one double bond. Um, and I this was the topic of my PhD. Uh, so I spent three years studying this reaction in a lot of detail. 
And the reason why we're interested in that is because these oxidation products, um, there are different oxidation products and all of these oxidation products are actually important monomers for the chemical industry um, for, for polymer production. And I looked uh, mostly at these uh, allylic oxidation products. So that's an oxidation here in this in this carbon and at, at the end. But there are also there's also the possibility of oxidizing the double bond here. Um, and and this uh, makes this this um, epoxide, uh, which is industrially, it's actually more interesting. And uh, this has actually sparked some more recent research. So this is this is kind of a niche field within electrochemistry. But there there was a, a paper that came out in Science just uh, a couple of weeks ago where they look into this reaction. Um, so if you want to check that out, uh, that there's like the the link there below. But um, I looked mostly into these allylic oxidation products. Um, I used uh, palladium as a catalyst for this reaction. And I tried to figure out what happens if you if you um, expose your electrodes to different potentials. What kind of products do you get out? And I, I saw that if you are at, at low to, to intermediate potentials, then you get a lot of these all allylic oxidation products. So you see the peak here for acrolyne, for a little alcohol and, and acrylic acid. While if you go to higher potentials, then we see um, a different type of product, uh, which is this uh, oxidation product of the double bond. We don't see the epoxide. Uh, that is because that is all in an aqueous acidic solution. And there this molecule just turns into propylene glycol immediately. Um, but we wanted to understand why why is it that we see such a shift in in selectivity with the potential, um, and that is uh, where we looked into electrochemistry mass spectrometry, and uh, we we ran uh, a series of measurements where we introduce propene at different voltages at different potentials at at the electrode. And then we run a cyclic voltammogram. So we scan the potential and we see different um, products coming up. We see different gases evolving depending on the electrochemical conditions. And uh, if we now do this, so this is just an example here for, for one uh, potential. But if we do this for a lot of potentials, we can see again that there is this interesting behavior that apparently at these intermediate potentials where we see a lot of products forming, we also see a lot of CO2 um coming off from the surface and this led us to think that probably there are some kind of that that the the surface is actually poisoned partially by reaction products during the reaction um and then but then right now we don't really this is just a hypothesis we think okay there's something on the surface and this something that is on the surface that might play a role in steering the selectivity, but we don't we don't really know we we can't it's it's not so easy to look at the surface. So what we do uh, is we use um, we decide to use desorption as a probe for adsorption. So what do I mean by that? Our we we thought if we have a surface that is highly covered, then probably there is not enough space for the propene to absorb with the double bond, because that, that's like a larger amount of the molecule that has to come down to the surface. So if there's no space, then probably we can only coordinate with this one carbon, while the uh, if there's more space, then we can coordinate with this double bond. And then uh, we see these two different products. With, uh, at, if we go to, to these negative potentials, we see propene coming off unchanged, and we see propene being reduced to propane. So there we actually access the double bond and we put some hydrogens onto this double bond. And this can only really happen if the double bond is coordinated to the surface. So, so our hypothesis is if we have low coverage, if we have high coverage, then we will have this coordination with the end carbon and we will have uh, propene coming off in, the, in this cathodic sweep. While if we have double bond coordination, then we will have propane coming off. So we went ahead and we did that. Um, but first we needed to cover the surface because we wanted to understand, okay, what, how, how does 
this uh, desorption correspond to coverage of the surface. And the way we cover surface and make sure that we vary the coverage is we put in propene and we scan to a certain anodic potential and get rid of some of the CO2, but not all of it. And we vary this. So uh, depending on, on what, what I'm showing here is the amount of CO2 coming off uh, as a function of the potential that we scan to. So the higher the potential, the more CO2 comes off, which we see as, okay, if we remove more, then that means that there must be more space left on the surface. So the higher uh, the cleaning potential, the lower the coverage of the surface. And then now we have these surfaces with different amounts of species sitting on top of them. So what we do then is we put in more propene. And what we think now is that if we have a lot of space, so around at, at these higher potentials, if we have a lot of space, then we will see more of this uh, coordination of the double bonds. So we will see more of the um, reduced gas coming off. So that's the, the one I showed in blue before. Uh, but if we if we don't have uh, a lot of space, then we will only see this a little coordination. And and our hypothesis is that the um, double bond coordination that will change with this uh, coverage, while the other one, the the um, coordination with one carbon, that will not change. Um, so we look at what comes off in the, in this cathodic strip, and we see actually yes. This our hypothesis is is correct. If we the higher the uh, cleaning potential, the lower the coverage, the more double bond coordinated propene we see come off. And the uh, propene that is a a probe for for the uh, one carbon coordination actually doesn't change with potential. So uh, ECMS really helped us to understand what we have on the surface. But then we, we we weren't quite satisfied with what we had there yet. We wanted to learn a little bit more about um, how strongly these species are, are uh, bound to the surface. Um, yeah, sorry, I so 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 to um, sum this up, basically what what we see is that we see um, oxidation um, of, of the allylic carbon as a function at, at, at high co coverage, while at low coverage, uh, propene uh, degrades and, and just uh, poisons the surface. And then whatever is left over can coordinate with the double bond. Um, but we also, as I said, I just said, uh, we, we also wanted to see how much um, if we if we can probe, if we can get more information about these surfaces or bits. And um, again, we, we tried to use the ECMS for that. And what we did in this case was uh, we introduce um, propene as we did before, but then uh, we thought, okay, so if we have like a lot of very strongly adsorbed species, then if we put in some other gas, they will just stay there. But what we, what we see, uh, what we do is we put, so we put in another gas. This other gas is CO. CO tends to bind very strongly especially to platinum and palladium. Um, and what we, but what we see when we put in CO, there it is that there is actually some propene coming off the surface. Um, and that was very interesting because that kind of indicated, okay, we have some kind of species that is loosely bound. And then we could, we, we also quantified this, um, but we thought, so we had this double, bond adsorbed species before that we could reduce while there were the other species we could only oxidize. So probably this here is just the same species as the one with double bond coordination. Um, so we did what we did in the previous experiments. We went to reducing potentials. We see some propene being stripped off as, as propane. Um, and then if we do the, the test of putting in CO, we see that there's no CO coming off. So this kind of indicates, okay, all, all th th this uh, propene that can be um, reduced to, to propane, all of this is the same as the one that can be displaced by CO. 
But if we now use uh, quantification and we use our, our whole uh, calibration procedure and we integrate these peaks, we, we figure out that actually the, the amount of propene that can be displaced is almost double the amount of, of this peak here. Um, so this indicates that there are two different weakly bound species, two species uh, that can be stripped off uh, cathodically and one that can is so loosely bound that it can just be displaced by CO. CO. Um, and with this, we also we, we also looked into it uh, a little bit further. We used a complementary technique um, that is uh, infrared spectroscopy and all this also this technique um, supports um, our hypothesis that we have different um, environments, different surface environments, depending on whether there is propene on the surface or not. So, so this is the CO peak and the CO peak shifts, and this is just uh, a sign that, that there is something different about the local environment on the surface. And um, all of this is, is very much detailed into a very specific reaction, but what this helps us understand is or, or that what this helped us understand is that it seems to really matter uh, how much species we have on the surface to steer this uh, reaction mechanism. And and I I don't have this included here right now, but we we continued this work and we made some uh, gold palladium alloy catalysts. Um, where instead of having like this poisoning effect, you change the surface adsorption energies and you get a similar effect. So then you uh, again, you only absorb this one carbon uh, because uh, the palladium doesn't absorb as strongly and we get a higher selectivity for these allyl oxidation products. Um, all right, enough about propene oxidation. Uh, let's move to another example. So. The reaction I'm I'm working on uh, these days in in my postdoc is lithium mediated nitrogen reduction. Um, and this, uh, why are we interested in this process? The current process of making ammonia uh, is the so-called Haber-Bosch process. It's a it's a heterogeneously catalyzed gas phase process that operates at very high temperatures and very high pressures. Um, the reaction that is occurring is uh, uh, nitrogen and hydrogen uh, are mixed and under this very high uh, pressure and, and temperature on a certain catalyst, they can combine to form ammonia. But because we have this very high pressure and temperature, uh, the process uh, requires to be centralized. So it, it, it's, only, it's only worth it to build like this really high pressure reactor if you can build it big. Um, and the hydrogen that is that that is part of of this reaction uh, is usually it usually comes from natural gas. So that means that this process has a really really large uh, CO two footprint. Um, it uses more than one percent of the global fossil fuels, and it is responsible for more than one percent of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So there's really something that we need to do uh, about this process if we want to. Um, make uh, the chemical industry more sustainable and less carbon intensive. And uh, the lithium mediate ni ni uh, or electrochemical nitrogen reduction is one way of, of making this process less carbon intensive, um, and it allows us to operate at near ambient conditions. However, there is a big problem if we look at, uh, at metal catalysts in, a, in an aqueous environment, and this big problem is hydrogen evolution. Uh, this this plot here shows um, that the potential at which uh, we will have um, nitrogen reduction or hydrogen uh, evolution occurring on different surfaces as a function of the uh, um, adsorption energy of nitrogen. Um, but, but, but that what we can see here is really that hydrogen evolution will always be present. So as long as we have something that can make hydrogen and in aqueous solution, we have water molecules which contain a lot of hydrogen. As long as we have this, we will always make lots of hydrogen. So this is why uh, people have started to look into non-aqueous systems where we just, because we use a different molecule, a different solvent molecule, not water, but a molecule where hydrogen is more strongly bound to the molecule. We have a lower proton activity, which means that the hydrogen evolution will be suppressed. 
And the second um, second effect of the system is it works quite similar to a lithium ion battery. Um, and and what happens on on in this system is that you um, deposit metallic lithium. Metallic lithium is very very reactive, and therefore it will react with your organic solvent, and it forms what is called a solid electrolyte interface. And the solid electrolyte interface acts as an additional barrier to keep the proton sources away from the electrode and only allow nitrogen gas to go through. Um, and then this nitrogen gas can react with lithium and then the lithium nitride can react with proton sources and you form ammonia. Um, and then in the last uh, five years, a lot of progress has been made in this reaction. People have studied it um, in, in different groups in the world, have really studied this process in a lot of detail. And one of the things that they realized is that um, if, you, if you don't run uh, at, a, at a constant current, but you actually pulse the current, you somehow get a process, uh, get better stability and better efficiency of your process. So instead of just um, turning on the potential at all times and having the reaction run at all times, you stop it. And then you wait. And then you start it again, and then it runs again for a little bit, and then you stop it again. Um, and we know that this works better, but we don't really know why. And in order to understand that, we need uh, some kind of time resolve technique. And this is again where electrochemistry mass spectrometry comes in, because with this technique, we can um, understand on a well result, so we, we have a very good time resolution. So we know we can run a pulse and measure the gas evolution during the pulse and during the break. Um, but again, as always, it's not so super straightforward. We have a certain um, overlap of, of products. Um, in particular, we have this overlap at mass 17, which is the largest signal for, for ammonia. We also have a um, contribution from water. Now, if we look at these, these normalized intensities, then it looks like, okay, uh, the, the, hydrogen, uh, the water signal is, is actually not that bad. But the problem is if we work uh, either in air or in an aqueous system, we have a lot of water around and we make very, very little ammonia. So the background signal will really overshadow our actual signal. Um, and one way of, of getting around that is using what is called soft ionization. Um, and that was done uh, by this group at DTU. Um, and what they do there is um, when you ionize your molecule of interest uh, in the mass spectrometer, you usually choose some kind of ionization energy that ionizes most of the compounds. But you can also choose an ionization energy that only ionizes one molecule, but not the other. And then that means you can choose an ionization energy that will only ionize ammonia, but will not ionize water. And in that way, you don't have any water ions. So you don't get this contribution here at all, but you only see a signal from ammonia. The problem with that is that then you don't see your side products. You only see the product of interest. So that is why uh, we have this uh, ECMS in a glove box, which allows us to um, work in a, an environment that is basically water free. Um, and in this system, then the only other challenge that we have is this overlap with methane, um, because it turns out when forming the solid electrolyte interface, um, a lot of methane is actually generated. And these results are very, very new. Um, Artem, who is a PhD student in the group, has been working on this for the better part of the last two years to try and get this to work. Um, but we manage now uh, to see uh, that both ammonia and methane in the system, and we are able to quantify it. So these are quantified mass spec signals. Um, and we see that uh, if we have nit a nitrogen atmosphere and we apply a certain uh, potential profile, we see that there we see some methane formation. That's the, the the orange line here. But we also see some ammonia formation. While in an argon atmosphere where we don't expect to have any nitrogen reduction because there's no nitrogen pre present, uh, we see no ammonia formation, uh, and we see a little bit of of methane generation, but not as much. 
Um, so this is literally out of the lab from last week, I think. So uh, we are really, really excited to look into this further. further. Um, and uh, we hope to have some very exciting results in the near future. Um, and now I would just like to move to a third example, and I will try and go through this a bit more quickly. Uh, and that is battery degradation. And this work uh, that was done mainly by Daisy Thornton and, and Bethan Davis in, in my group, um, I haven't been involved personally that much, but I think it is still a really good example to show what electrochemistry mass spectrometry can help us do. Um, I'm sure you've seen a battery, a lithium ion battery that is kind of inflated. It often happens if you have like an old battery in your phone or your laptop uh, or you misuse your battery in some way, then it can happen that it inflates. Um, and in a really, really bad case, uh, it, it leads to fires. And the reason why this happens is because you have some um, gas formation in the battery uh, so that these gases can be um, hydrogen, CO, ethylene, CO2 uh, and others. Um, and we want to understand where do these gases come from? How much do we form uh, and under which conditions in order to be able to change some things about the battery and make it better and reduce this gas evolution? Um, so just very briefly, how does a lithium ion battery work? We have uh, a cathode that contains um, some that it, there's usually some kind of uh, oxide material that contains lithium. And then we have an anode, which is usually graphite. And when we charge this battery, then we move the lithium ions uh, into the graphite uh, and, and, and the uh, electrons uh, move in another circuit. And then uh, we have a lot of lithium in, in the graphite, but it's um, energetically more favorable to be in the oxide. So that's why when you connect it, uh, then it will power your instruments. And if we now look more closely on, on this uh, graphite surface, then we see that, um, again, we have the solid electrolyte interface formation because, uh, again, we have lithium in an organic system. Lithium is very reactive, even if it's within graphite. Uh, so it will form this electrolyte interface. And while forming the solid electrolyte interface, uh, some gases are generated. And these are, uh, in particular, ethylene and some CO. And then there is also uh, often you or always you have some trace water and this trace water will also will react to form hydrogen. So following these gases can help us understand these uh, uh, formation processes and it can tell us whether the surface is stable over time or not. Because if it's not stable, if we have gas formation that kind of indicates that there are some reactions going on that we don't want to have because the only thing we want to have is lithium ions moving back and forth. Um, so, so the gas evolution is really always an indication of what is what else do we have going on on our surface. Um, and in order to study that, uh, Daisy did a lot of work to develop a new uh, type of cell where we have a, um, a parallel configuration, and um, she also got a patent granted for that. Um, and using the cell, we, we actually see that it perform, performs very similar to uh, a um, coin cell, which is the type of cell that is usually used in, in batteries. Um, but if we now look at, at, at the results, uh, they what they did, they studied uh, a standard electrolyte that uh, contains one molar lithium fluor per perfluorophosphate, um, and it contains uh, these two molecules as, as electrolyte, as, as solvents, ethylene carbonate and ethyl methyl carbonate. And um, what is known from, from the literature is that they, they produce different types of gases. So if we, if we look at the, a graphite electrode, uh, electrode in the first cycle of charging, uh, because of a solid electrolyte interface formation, we see CO and ethylene developing. Um, and, and literature tells us that the ethylene probably comes from ethylene carbonate, while the CO comes from, uh, from uh, EMC. Um, and in order to verify that, what we did uh, was to just change the electrolyte composition and leave out the ethylene carbonate completely. And what we see now is we actually see a different behavior in hydrogen evolution. 
um, that could be related to either some processes with the electrolyte or that there are different amounts of water present in these electrolytes. Um, but we also see that there is no ethylene formation um, with uh, just EMC. So that, that indicates that this um, reaction to form ethylene is really only due to, to EC. Um, and then there is a, a second thing that we are interested in in these batteries, which is crosstalk. So as you can see, that there is actually no gas barrier in between the electrodes. So if you if you have a battery, then you have your electrodes quite close to each other, and gases can actually cross over. And there is uh, at at the cathode, you often form CO two, and we wanted to understand uh, does the CO two form that the at the um, cathode does that do anything at the anode? So we introduced CO two to the system. And then we see uh, with e still using just EMC, where we only saw CO evolving before, now we see some ethylene evolving. And that is a very interesting result for a different reason, which is that there is a whole field of trying to use uh, CO2, uh, trying to use CO2 to make carbon-based chemicals. And people are usually using aqueous solutions for that, but there's kind of a The, the field has come to kind of a standstill in, in regards to which catalyst materials work. So people are trying to move to new systems. And um, this really indicates that looking at this lithium uh, battery system could also be of, of interest for CO2 reduction. Um, all right. So I uh, showed you a lot about how we can use electrochemistry mass spectrometry. Um, to study electrochemical reactions. And I showed you how I used it for studying surface adsorbates in propene oxidation, how we look at the uh, different products generated in lithium mediated nitrogen reduction and uh, in bat battery degradation. Um, and with this, I would like to thank uh, all the people that contributed to this work and uh, uh, the, especially the interfacial electrochemistry group uh, in the Department of Materials here uh, that where I've been working for the last half year. Um, and thanks a lot for showing up here and uh, and listening to my talk also to the people online. I Let me know if you have any questions or uh, you can also send me an email if, if there's something of interest. Or are you just completely overwhelmed <laughs> now? Yes. Sure. No pressure. Uh, yeah, you can go back to it. I was going to ask you this kind of generally. What drives your interest in the kind of uh, like, um, what, for example, brings me here is just what radically cheaper electricity could mean for the techno-economics of doing all of these things. Presumably that's something that's also motivating for you and like the, the novelty that this allows that hasn't been afforded in the past. And then therefore just like what you think the highest leverage kinds of opportunities are that this ability to take fine grained look at the internals of reactions uh where, where is that most promising do you mean you want to know which reactions or just more yeah like... very generally like what motivates you about okay, i think which, like areas which kinds of process so so i think there are there are basically for for making this whole um transition to uh renewable or to using renewable electricity for the chemical industry to make this happen i think two things have to happen one is to uh, implement it industrially upscale processes that already exist make them which is happening for uh water electrolysis at the moment. There are a bunch of companies around trying to upscale different processes to make hydrogen from water with very high efficiency and at low cost. Uh, that is one thing that needs to happen. But on the other hand, there are also 
especially with these new reactions. Maybe hydrogen evolution has been studied for many years in excruciating detail. And there are still people looking at it. And I think that is also very valuable information that they still get out of this. But what motivates me to study the more complex systems is because I think that the, the potential what we can get out of it is really, really big. If we can actually have a plant where we press a button, we have a solar panel, it produces fertilizer for the field right next door. If we can make this happen, this will make a huge difference, uh, especially in parts of the world where that at the moment don't have access to fertilizers. There is a, a large part uh, in, in rural Africa, for example, where there is no, um, no access to fertilizer because it has to be made in these big, big facilities. And therefore, I think it's, it's really, we, we need to understand these processes to give them the chance to be upscaled. Because often if they are, if we use a system like the, the lithium mediated system that we have, we're studying at the moment, we are making small amounts of ammonia on catalysts that are not very affordable. But if we understand what is happening, what it takes to make ammonia, then we can think of other catalysts that can make maybe work better or can work just as well, but be a lot cheaper. Um, yeah, so I think I think that is really motivating me to look into these reactions because they have a huge potential, but they are not well enough understood for us to know which sheet materials we could be using instead of the expensive ones that we are using at the moment. Oh, yeah, sure, thank you. And also, I, I guess presumably there are competing techniques, but you are less optimistic about them. I mean, uh, with regards to to ammo making ammonia for using. Oh, I meant more with regard to being able to put a microscope on what's happening during the process. Uh, I think we need all of these techniques. It's just that I've specialized in in mass spectrometry, and that's why I'm using that these days because okay. I've just gained a lot of experience with this technique over the last years. But as I showed in one of the slides, uh, we've been using IR spectroscopy, uh, and uh, I've also been using uh, X-ray, various types of X-ray spectroscopy to look at different types of this, uh, different places of the sample. And we are even building a, a cell at the moment, which allows us to uh, put light onto the reaction while we look at the mass spec. Um, so so we are, we are, I think, what is really important is that we don't just stick with one thing and we look at only look at the reaction only from one side, but we look from as many sides as possible. And this takes people with different types of expertise to work together. Thank you. Yeah, there was one question online about uh, regarding battery degradation. They asked, what kind of cells are you using for gas evolution studies? Um, we we use this kind of cell that Daisy developed, uh, which is it is it is not quite a coin cell, but we um, we use a coin cell for for inspiration. So basically, what we have here is we have a, a lithium metal or or whatever um, counter electrode that we use uh, a separator, and then we have the working electrode coated on on a mesh. Um, and the reason why it needs to be a mesh is so the gases can go through the mesh uh, to to the chip. Um, and even though this this looks a bit different uh, from from a coin cell, we do have the nice uh, parallel configuration. We get a uniform current distribution, as and as you can see here, basically we um, we see a similar behavior in in the ECMS cell as in the coin cell. Does that answer the question? Well, pretty much out of time, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs>